Hey, everybody. Welcome to Cars with Cocktails, the show where Charles and I uh, join two things, go perfectly together, drinking and driving. Today, uh, we are drinking, what are we drinking today? This is, this was recommended by several people because we had kind of a run of gin drinks, either on purpose or accidentally. This is a Gimlet, which is, I think, one of those like iconic classic drinks. Um, hopefully, it's better than that disaster of whatever the hell we had last time. That shit was terrible. Uh, so the ingredients are super easy. It is gin. It is lime juice. It is, I'm reading my ingredients to make sure I get it right because I forgot it four seconds ago. And uh, they say simple syrup. There's a bunch of like add-ons you could put in it. But uh, yeah, the, the basic is just what I said. I have a honey simple syrup that I made earlier. And uh, yeah, so cheers. It looks, smells yeah. great. Cheers. I I don't have uh, the honey simple syrup. I just have right <laughs> regular. Sounds like he may have made it a little strong. I it's I mean again it's one of those things when it's like primarily alcohol. Uh, I get a little uneasy, but I think by you know if this is the cup, I think by about here it'll be it'll be prime primely smooth, as they I, say. So we'll, I enjoy it. I think it's good. Yeah, I'm not hating on it. What are we talking about today, anyway? Today we're going to be talking about warranty voiding in mods and TD1. TD, do we know what TD1 stands for, by the way? I, I actually don't know what TD1 stands for. Um, I don't know. I, yeah. I, it dates back pretty far. I think TD1 dates back, as far as I know, to before flash tunes or, or uh, I think when, not when they would detect it ever, but you could manually note it. And I want to say it was sometime in like 05, 06 is the first time I recall hearing something about TD1. Yeah, I, I want to say it was earlier than that, but you know, I, I don't know for sure enough. And, and Audi, I think, has been ahead of the curve. They're always the leader uh, for sure. In, in this world, because for a time. So let's back up a little bit and kind of talk about what that means and, and how, you, how you get TD1 today. I'll also say, I think this is going to be super important. As of the date of this recording, this is the information as we know it. At any point in time, it, this won't be the, accurate. Yeah, the I mothership can change before. the rules and how it's done today can be totally different. So keep in mind that, uh, you know, this, this may be a little bit timely as far as what, uh, what we're saying now. And uh, I mean, obviously the history of it's not gonna change, but the way you get flagged today is gonna probably be different the way you get flagged three years from now. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Uh, so I, for, for anybody not familiar, TD1 is a system that VW and Audi uses for flagging your car for being modified. Generally, it's designated now, I think specifically for tunes, but his, uh, historically, I think it was any modification, you could flag a car TD1 manually. And historically, originally, it was a set, uh, essentially the dealer is a dick face and they want to screw you over and they TD1 your car. Or the customer is a dick face no, he and didn't. they're trying to get, they're trying to pull one over on you and you spent, you know, three weeks trying to unscrew their problem because they swore up and down it wasn't tuned, come to find out that it was actually tuned. Um, yeah, so I think as of kind of like this newest generation, don't quote me on that it started with the Mark 7 vintage because it could have been before that. But, uh, and, and Audi again has been ahead of the curve on this one. So for previously, you brought your car in and you had lowered suspension as a dealer tech, I don't care, right? I, I care very little unless I got to do a bunch of work to like get your car up in the air. And unless it's ridiculous, I'm probably just like bitching to the guys in the shop and not really worried about it. But if you had an issue, say you had a Mark IV with a tune on it that uh, kept the fans running all the time or something like that, we as dealer technicians, we would have to note that potentially the car was tuned. And oftentimes, even, even long ago, you could tell a car was tuned, right? You could drive it and compare boost levels. Uh, the newest way they're, they're telling is based on flash count and how many times a car's been flashed, a module's well, we, been flashed. Well, we don't even know that exactly. I mean, I, that test plan, I don't know that that test plan specifically is looking for flash counter. Um, because the other thing is, is ECM updates 
it would have to basically compare ECM updates versus flash counter, right? Right, but it knows that it would have had these many updates. Correct, it should, in, in theory. I just, don't, my thing is, I don't know. Do you know if that's the case? I'm not positive it uses flash counter. That is what I've been told. Um, you know, what, <laughs> how much secrecy and, uh, and, and, and underhandedness goes on in this world, you know, it's, it's uh, probably more than a little bit, I'll say. I can tell you from experience, um, my Golf R, uh, was flagged TD1 very early on. And I know it wasn't the tech that like actively did it because you used to have to actively like yeah. fill the form out. And unless you were a complete dick bag or the dealership was full of a complete dick bags, like the service advisor or service manager, that never happened. Uh, yeah. e but now even early Mark seven was not, it, it could happen. So this is kind of the progression of how things went, at least from my estimation. And, you know, obviously I have content. I, I, I don't know if you and I have ever talked about this together or I, I certainly have separately and I've talked about it at length in Ask App stuff or some version of that um, is originally it was all manually. The only right. way you could do it by, was by manually recording. You'd have to, they have to submit it through a warranty claim to flag it. It was, or, uh, or, you know, whatever, through the hub or whatever. Um, and that was the only way it would happen. That and later that, changed a little that, bit. That TD1, that version of TD1 was forever. There was no chance you could get that removed once it had been flagged at the point where it was a manual flag by the dealership. It was, this is TD1 forever. Right. And they also TD1 for a variety of things, including, you know, the things like ECM flashes or other mods on the car in general. So that there was, it was very broad. Now T1 is, the, let me, let me backtrack because I'm getting kind of sidetracked. The next step that I heard of in terms of T D one, when it came to Mark seven was a test plan you could run if you suspected a car to have been tuned. And this was not even right away in Mark seven. This was like deep into, I don't know, I would say 2017. Yeah, Roughly? I was I was thinking model year 2017, 2018. There's probably an Otis, which is the factory VW Audi scan tool, a factory update that went through that then added this test plan. Because I remember in some of my Audi classes talking about Audi having this test plan and auto flagging cars back in 2016, I think. Yeah. 2016, oh, really? 2017. Audi yeah. Like that too, huh? yeah, Audi yeah. Audi was years ahead. I won't not like decades, but yeah, several years ahead of, of where VW was in the auto flagging world. Yeah, so I knew that was the case, or or I had heard that that was the case in the Audi world. I didn't I didn't realize it was that far in advance. Um and and kind of I only heard about that retroactively. I because I don't obviously have as many Audi relationships as I do VW. Um but yeah, so that was the step is that was only done if you suspected a car to have been tuned. You could run this test plan. It would allow it to determine whether the car was flashed, and then it would flag it uh, automatically through the system. Now, in this current day and age, um, and I'm not – you probably – you might be a little more clear on this. I'm not exactly clear on this. It seems like if you bring a car in for Diag and run it through guided fault finding – it will just potentially auto flag it. That's what happened to my car. So um, when they run that full scan and essentially dial up the mothership, which is what the technician did because there was like a radio software update. And let me be clear. I care zero about this car being flagged TD1. I mean, it was going to happen anyway. Uh, even if I had a damn warranty claim, um, uh, I, I know for sure the powers that be at VW know this car, know the car is modified and would, uh, would have given the dealership some guff on it. So I, I care zero that it's, that it's flagged. But I brought it in for this radio update, and I think I brought it in, say, on Friday, and by Monday it showed up. So as soon as that scan, that full scan, goes up to the mothership, which is you know, it's all cloud-based stuff now, so it literally is a, mother, a mothership. Uh, if they see discrepancies, is how I'll say it, in what – your software is 
versus what they say it should be, then it gets flagged. Now, in this flag, allegedly, I've never dealt with this directly. Allegedly, you can get the TD1 removed. Uh, I'm sure it's a whole song and dance of paperwork and inspections and nonsense and bullshit that you got to go through. But allegedly, you can get that TD1 removed. I know, I know you can uh, because I've heard of people who bought cars who, that were modded. They didn't know it. And ironically, some of them are CPO cars, which is hilarious. Um, and then say, I don't want, I don't want the tune of my car. I want the yep. warranty, you know, whatever. And then they get it off. Now that's a very different scenario than I, I think the people are going to have a very hard time with the idea of if your car breaks, flashing it back to stock, getting them to lift your TD one, if it's broken, there's zero chance that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it boils down to this. If you modify your car, before you do that, you have to have a very deep personal conversation and answer honestly, if my car breaks, let's just use the ECM tune because it's easy. If I tune this car and my turbo goes out, I throw a rod through the block, I spin a lobe on a cam and the head comes apart. Am I prepared to make this payment for this repair out of pocket. If the answer is no, you probably shouldn't modify the car. Now, we're all gonna hope and pray and, and say, say our little rain dance that it doesn't break, but- The likelihood, the failure rates on Mark 7s are very low uh, in general for major engine stuff. You know, obviously we had some turbo problems in the very beginning. There are a few engine problems in the very beginning, but as a general rule, there are not a lot of issues. I know we've talked about in the past, the um, the crank walk issue, this is, as I said then, this issue is a thing, but it's not a thing that's legitimate in the sense that it's not a widespread problem that everybody should be concerned about, which is again, what I said then, what I'll say it again, I was gonna make a video about it, I was gonna talk about it, I did a bunch of stuff to try to get as much data as I could about it, and then ultimately decided with talking with a couple different people. Um, listen, I, I, we were offering no solution that we were not really addressing a problem that we that was widespread. And because of that, I felt like addressing it would create more panic than than would it would help. Uh, and yeah, so this I, isn't like CCTA water pumps and timing chain tension or failures, right? right? Where you right. can pretty much bank on um, it's gonna on, happen on the failure. But yeah, the, the crank walk thing. I get asked about it a lot too. And I'm just like, yeah, basically just to echo what you said, it happens. It's low failure rate compared to how many of these cars are out there. The majority of these owners of Mark seven owners are not on VW vortex talking about their crank walk, right? right. The majority of them just drive their shit and live happily ever after. Uh, so yeah, but, but if you're tuned, and you have a crank walk, I mean, the most people don't come in and say, hey, will you check the crank walk on my car? It's weird clutch issues. It's timing chain or timing related faults that all play into that uh, crank walk, at least from the cars that I've seen do it. Uh, what do you think the technician is gonna do? The first thing they're gonna do is run faults. First thing they're gonna do, they know it's under warranty. They're gonna run the full scan. It's gonna upload. Now your car's flagged. Right. It, you're not, you're not getting out of wiggling out of this situation. Um, no. and even if you suspect it. So yeah, I, I definitely, the one problem with this always is, you know, it's an assumed risk and the likelihood is very low that you're going to have a problem. But again, uh, again, I have <clears throat> this, this lime juice that has not been refrigerated. <laughs> so um, Paul's hoping, living on the edge today. Yeah. I'm riding with the angels, just like the people who mod their car. And, and hope that the engine doesn't blow up. So we'll see. Well, you know, I, I, it, it is a low failure rate. It, look, the, the tuning companies do a pretty good amount of R&D, even the ones that aren't the biggest players. And you kind of know, like, I can push it to here, seven, we'll say. I can push to seven safely. The car's capable of going to 10, but if I go to 10, there's going to be a lot of dumbasses out there doing hot rod shit with their car pushing it harder than I would really, you know, really like them to do. So we, we dial it back to 6.8 instead of seven. So they're, they're pretty safe. Cause look, 
if APR starts tuning cars and one in four blow up, um, that's bad news for APR, right? Just as an example, I'm not saying AP, I'm not, I'm not saying APR does that. <laughs> Just using that as an example. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but there's, there's so much like misconception and just, just fucking nonsense about this whole world. Okay. And th th this is the point in the conversation where it goes to, as of right now, today, this is kind of how it is. Um, and I'll also ding another disclaimer, every single warranty repair, whether it's you have a broken grab handle in your Mark 7, or your engine grenaded because your turbo grenaded is case by case approval, okay? If you bring your car in for something broken, that does, even if it's one day old, nothing guarantees that that repair will be covered under warranty. Yeah, I, I think the best example that is gonna be more clear to people is the idea of a car accident. So if you, if you leave the dealership after buying your brand new car, and smash into a telephone pole. You don't get to turn around and say, hey, this car you sold me, it, it smashed in the front. <laughs> it's broken. The, it, the, key, the key term people need to understand when it comes to warranty, the only things that are warranty-able uh, with that, outside like a certain grace period. And there's like some, some asterisks in this world. Don't get caught up in the nitty gritty of what I'm about to say. The things that are covered under warranty are manufacturer defects. They are not outside influence. They are not wear and tear. They are not dash rattles beyond a few thousand miles. It's the part failed because of a defect in the part. A design flaw, not technically covered under warranty. Depends, it depends on the design flaw. But yeah, uh, well, I mean, good example. Uh, clutches are something that you know, wear items have a one year, 12,000 mile warranty. So things like brakes, clutches, stuff like that. Uh, but I can say from my experience, and I don't know if this has been yours as well, is usually the first clutch you kill gets covered under warranty. I, I have seen, so this is very dealer dependent um, and not all, may, all, not all wear and tear items are covered for 1212. Uh, some are only six months, some are no months. I mean, we've had cars that, the customer bought and 150 miles later, they blew the clutch out because they had no idea how to drive manual transmission. The dealership ended, pay, ended up paying for that, not Volkswagen. So there's some, there's some things where like the dealership can cover it yeah. and VW doesn't. Again, there's like, there's so much nitty gritty bullshit that it's yeah. almost like pointless to get caught up in it. Um, Nobody would want, to, would want to hear that conversation. There's too much. No, it's too much the most boring video. fucking legalese dumb crap like i'm already bored even just thinking about it um yeah. and, the, and dealing in it the next thing i think is important to cover uh, although actually i want to go back to something um you were talking about tuners and stuff like that i want to i want to bring up something that i've seen more of recently and with the mark 7 being a platform that is very widespread and very tuned tuners matter um i've said this historically from the very beginning of, of me talking about all this stuff around tuning and stuff like that is that, you know, obviously you're, we're a Unitronic dealer. We offer Cobb stuff. You know, we, we offer a variety of tunes. You have an IE tune on your car. I think that tunes matter in the sense that the, the more mainstream tuners, they, they a lot of times people want to squeeze every ounce of power they can out of an engine. And, and the thing that always concerns me is they do that by going to smaller tuners. Now, I am not somebody, you know, as somebody who started very small as a one man business and then, and we're, you know, growing as, as time goes by, I don't want to shit on anybody who's, who's coming up, but I do want people to understand that smaller tuners oftentimes take more risks, probably because they're trying to a either make a name for themselves or B they haven't really factored in the real risk relative to their customers. And, and, you got a lot, a lot less recourse against somebody who's really small than you do against somebody who's a lot bigger. So I have seen things like, um, like, uh, spark plugs getting blown to pieces where the electrode gets blasted off. Um, uh, the ceramic gets exploded. I've seen engine problems.
that that have definitely related to certain tuners. Um, I'm not trying to put anybody on blast or anything, but my my thing is is understand the dynamic of what happens when you start trying to squeeze every ounce of power, and that means usually the big tuners have tried to get there, and then they're like, "Oh shit, that's not good." We're gonna dial this shit back a little bit because that's too far. Right. I, I, you know, when when you talk about the big players, you talk about APR, you talk about integrated, you talk about Unitronic um, and and Cobb, and there's probably a couple other where they're not like the big players, but they're kind of in this middle range where I'd I'd feel safe. United Motorsports is one, although their customer service is the worst. <laughs> fucking customer service on the planet. Sorry, Unitron. Uh, sorry, uh, United, but you know I'm right. That's why I don't have a United Motorsports Haldex tune, we'll just say, on the Golf R. Um, but when you go with one of those, yeah, it, they probably have blown one up, so they know this is too far. Let's dial that back 30%. I and, have uh, tried to influence um, some of the tuners. I'm going to leave who it is specifically out um, to talk more about the things they do to test limits because I think the community would, would see a lot of benefit and actually give a lot of trust in them if they did that. But they, they are fucking super secret squirrel club uh, masters <laughs> and and think that that's a more important thing to talk about and we're going to make sure that nobody knows except for us uh which i think is just frankly fucking stupid but that's that's my opinion uh, yeah i uh you know the super secret squirrel thing is such horse shit that uh it, it's it's comical and when you you know when you present these numbers to your audience to your potential client base of course, someone looking for a tune is going to look at like the max horsepower this tune's going to get, right? I'm spending $700 hundred percent 40 wheel horsepower, or I'm spending $700 to get 43 wheel horsepower. Some people are going to take the 43. I'm not. I'm going to do like three more levels of research. And, you know, my recommendation is always like, go with a tuner that has some local support for you. If you have a great APR dealer near you, go with APR. If you have a great Unitronic dealer next, you know, down the road and you like those guys, go with Unitronic. If you want to do it at home, look at Cobb, look at IE. Even Unitronic, I think, does the at home, at home tune. The off-the-shelf tune is going to not deliver the maximum capacity for tuning, right? For horsepower, for torque, for whatever. It's the off the shelf's never going to deliver that, but it's going to deliver something that's pretty damn good, pretty damn safe, pretty damn reliable. If you want to go that route, you're going to have someone have to dyno tune your car anyway. Also, the other thing that, that I've talked about in the past that I think people don't really internalize and it's hard to really internalize it until you've experienced it is drivability is because if you squeeze every ounce of power at max power potential, it's, it's going to be at an RPM, which is something you don't reach every day. So now you've taken your daily driver and you fucked it up because you've tried to squeeze every ounce of, drive, of power out of it, but destroyed your drivability, and it sucks donkey dick to just sit there in traffic in your car. Yeah, but when you're doing it for that dirt nasty tuner life, you know, who fucking cares? It's for the clout. You got to do it for the gram. Yeah. No, for the talk. Wait, uh, what do they call it? What's the short version of the TikTok? I don't know. I think talk. I think talk. Is it the talk? Do it for yeah. the talk? If, if, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Charles, Charles and I, we both do, uh, we do TikTok dancing uh, yeah. in our I, spare uh, time. I have uh, been doing a lot of TikTok dancing. My daughter wants a TikTok. Keep in mind, my daughter's five. <laughs> she wants a TikTok. <laughs> she wants a TikTok, and she got mad at me. I was like, "All right, like, there's some fun shit on TikTok." Oh, there. You're hating on TikTok. I get it. Like, I basically hate all social media at this point in my life. Anyway, if I wasn't doing what I was doing, you, I wouldn't be on any of it. But I am, so I am. Um, and TikTok right now is the only, the only. I like YouTube a lot because I earned some money off YouTube. But TikTok is the only place where I actually like, oh, this is good content, right? It, um, and, it's such a and weird platform in that it's way. It's so fucking weird. 
Uh, but she got bent the fuck out of shape because I was like, you can, we can have a TikTok. It'll be for the family. We can do all the fun things, but you are not allowed to like surf it without like no. I'm holding the phone. Yeah, no. She got pissed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, bro. You're five. You don't get that <laughs> shit. Uh, anyway, um, back to, back to tuning and, and whatnot. And, you know, so I spent my career as a dealer tech and as a dealer technician, oftentimes didn't care for tuned cars. I didn't care that it was tuned. I just didn't want to fucking deal with it, right? I have, I have my parameters, which I operate in. I know these are the values that a stock engine behaves under. And when you're tuned, that shit kind of goes out the window. I also don't like having to get paid the same amount to do more work, which is oftentimes what happens when a car is modified at the dealership. You, uh, the, the technician ends up getting screwed. Um, that said, there is a lot of misconceptions about getting flagged, what's covered, and what's not, which was why I was trying to make that point about like every single warranty claim is case by case. So your shit might be different than what we're gonna talk about. A perfect example, my car's flagged. TD1, stage two, downpipe, charge cooler, intake, turbo inlet pipe, some shop dap wheel spacers, just mm. uh, plugging that shit real shop quick. Um, yeah. I, I'd say I'd put a link to them, but let's be honest, I won't. It's, it's not gonna happen. No, 0% chance. Uh, but so, so I modified, right? That does not mean that my warranty is voided. You, the only way I've ever seen a warranty get blanket void, meaning don't give a shit what's wrong, don't care about anything, you're not covered, is if salvage. a vehicle has a salvage title. Yeah, sal salvage title, yeah. That, that is it. I, I, am, I am flagged. And I had a grab handle fail on my Golf, which apparently all of them do. It's a stupid design. The whole headliner assembly shit is retarded. The Mark fucking seven. grab handles? It's oh my junk. God. You need an act of God to remove one of those, those grab handles from the car. It's, but if you install it wrong, you bend the bracket and it never goes in right. It's, it's fucking crazy. I was it's like- It's stupid. So we were, I, when we looked into it, I was like, oh, wait, maybe we should offer this special tool because it's like a this like weird wedge thing that you like stick up in there. It doesn't fucking work. It doesn't work at all. And I, I did, was like, oh. I did a video on how to remove them. I should f download that video and like retitle it because the video sucks, but the technique is good. Just a pocket screwdriver works. I know really well. that's that's what everybody at the shop uses a pocket screwdriver. So I was like, oh well, we can't offer this because you just use a screwdriver because that's a better. That's a better way to do it. Yeah. It was like a bent pocket screwdriver that has like a 45 degree bend in it. Um, yeah, you just do it like the uh, the old airbag, the Mark IV airbag. Yeah, tools, yeah. And it works perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, exactly like the Mark. Oh, those just, were 90, right? Yeah, those were 90. Those were a little little more intense. But uh, but anyway, so that, that handle was covered under warranty because there was not an overlap between my flag and the design. <laughs> I said design failures aren't covered, but we're going to call that a manufacturer defect. Uh, it was covered and they took care of it. And okay. So let me put a finer win. point on this because I, so a lot of people in these circumstances, they talk about Magnus and Moss and blah, 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 whatever. I don't know how much you know about Magnus and Moss. Um, Magnus and Moss was a thing that existed. I think sometime in the seventies or eighties that essentially was a law that said that manufacturers couldn't void your warranty if you didn't use factory maintenance parts because that's what was happening they would tell you you couldn't use an aftermarket oil filter or else your whole warranty in your car was void um that's what that was for people use that to apply and think it applies to modifying your car and it does not and and i actually did a video goddamn probably five years ago now with a lemon law lawyer out of Michigan. Uh, his name is Steve Leto. You can go back and check it out. It's a long video. It's very nerdy. Um, it explains all of this shit in very close detail. But essentially, modifying your car has almost zero to do with Magnus and the Magnus and Moss Act, which is what which is what that whole thing was for. That was about warranty maintenance and stuff like that. And more importantly, and this is the the most important part of it 
if a dealer tells you they're not going to warranty something, the only option you have is to sue them. Now, I don't know if you've ever paid a lawyer for anything. I know you probably have, Charles. <laughs> I have. Lawyer, it's not cheap. Lawyers are fucking expensive, way yeah. more expensive than the technician cost. So paying a shop is a shitload cheaper than the $300 an hour you're going to pay the lawyer to try to sue the people to get the money to then get them to repair your car. So just keep in mind, when you're paying somebody $300 to $400 an hour, if you want a halfway decent lawyer, it gets expensive real quick. Yeah, and that's just for like the chance to maybe. That's not a guarantee. Uh, yeah, I, I really have nothing to add to that. It, it does not apply... It, basically, the way I look at that, that act is like, you can put a Fram air filter in your car instead of a factory air filter. And as long as it's like functioning properly, it's fine. I can change the oil in my own car. I don't have to bring it to the dealership. That's fine. That's, that's not going to impact my warranty in any way. Uh, however, if you, um, you know, slap a new stage 100 turbo on your car and the ship blows up, you can't like try and claim that act because you slap the stage 100 turbo on your Here's car. Here's a so. really good example. I, I think based off of what you just said. So you talk about doing a frame air filter, not voiding your warranty, right? But then you take the same car, you put a K&N air filter on it and it's a mass airflow sensor car. And if you over oiled a K&N air filter, and put it on a car that had a mass airflow sensor, which for our audience who are Mark 7 yeah. owners, your car doesn't have a mass airflow sensor, so don't worry about yeah, this. But if you own a Mark IV, this definitely happened if to your car right, at some point. If you own a Mark IV or a Mark V or a Mark VI, um, if you put a K&N on your car and you over-oil it, the oil will get sucked in through the intake and then deposit on the mass airflow sensor, which is just a heated wire. It will kill it. And then... That will be dead. Now your mass airflow sensor is gone. You need a new one. You can try to clean it, see if it helps. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, whatever. But that would be something that would have, obviously those cars are way out of warranty at this point, but that would not have been covered under warranty in that circumstance. So um, good example of showing a part that has the same function necessarily, but not the same outcome. Right. And, uh, you know, you would, you would have to consider that a performance part. I think K&N probably, isn't it K&N performance air filters? I <laughs> like it's right in the name. Um, it's, it's, there's a gray area in there too, because in the Mark four days, all of the mass airflow sensors failed, except like the VR six ones were, were weirdly pretty a good. A lot of them fail. Yeah, for sure. But like, that was such a common failure that if you had a K&N air filter, you might get lucky and you might get a technician that's like, eh, this airflow meter is bad. Anyway, you buy an air filter, let's put a new air filter in it. Let's put an airflow meter in it under warranty. We're right. going to call it good. Well, back um, in those days, there were, people generally wouldn't be dick faces for no reason to make a big thing out of anything. Be, I don't know. <laughs> people, it depends people on historically the dick faces. Yeah. Uh, if VW Vortex said, then you better. Uh, ran into that more than more than one time in my career, but it, I think I think the big takeaway is like there is no hard fast. This is you know A equals B equals C. Um, it's always a gray area. There's always some leverage that the dealership has to both cover and not cover. So much of whether something is covered or not depends on the dealer a little bit, but what it really depends more on, more on, uh, is the technician working on your car. You could have brought your car to my dealership that I worked at for a million years. It got me and I give no shits about your car being modified. You could have got the dude across the shop who gave all the shits about your car being modified. And unless that got escalated, you may be covered under warranty if I work on it, you may not. Or you may or may not be if the other guy works on it. This yeah. is why you, if you're going to not do all of your own shit, you better have somebody that you trust that you know is like walking that line of looking out for everyone, right? As a technician, I, I'm looking out for me, first of all, because I, I, I mean, I don't go there because it's awesome. I go there to get paid. Um, I'm looking out for my customer. 
I'm looking out for my dealership. And ultimately, like, I have to be compliant with what the brand says, because if I'm not compliant with the, what the brand says and I make a repair and the brand declines that repair after it's made, because they never do it before, it's always after it's made, the dealership doesn't get paid from the brand. I, if I've gotten paid, then get that money taken back, right? And what sucks even more than not getting paid for something is getting paid and then getting that money taken back. That's yeah. like the biggest kick in the balls. I, so let's let's explain it for people a little bit because I think you're you're making assumptions that people understand the whole dynamics of this. Uh, let's let's break it down. So technicians at dealerships get paid based on the hours they produce, which is based on what they've the work they've done and any given day, and any given moment. Let's say X job pays one hour, they do it in a half hour, they get paid one hour. They do it in two hours, they get paid one hour. So that happens. They work on your car. Your car is questionable in terms of warranty. They just do the work. Hey, we're going to get this done for this customer. Take care of them. Great. Cool. Great. They spend five hours in your car, work on your car. They're getting paid five hours. Perfect. Awesome. Warranty claim gets submitted to VW after the fact. It gets submitted, gets denied. The dealership gets then is rejected for their claim and the technician the service advisor and the dealership all get back flagged for the hours that they've submitted along with eating the parts, whatever they put on the car. So that is now went from something that would have made them some money to now a massive loss and everyone's part and the dealership's part because they are eating the part and whatever additional labor they thought they were getting paid for the technician's time uh, who then they're going to back flag him for and he's not going to get paid for his time. And the, the service advisor also, who's not going to get paid for their time. So this is a, this is a very uh, nuanced subject that I think a lot of people don't understand the dynamics of that, that the reason why people are rejecting your claims, uh, at least in legitimate circumstances, again, there are dick faces that exist out there in the world are because of these reasons. These are all a hundred percent legitimate. And now they're a bigger concern probably more than ever. In, in the early, in the mid 2000s, it was like, you want to avoid people's claim over, over a tune, unless it was something that was a big deal, that was clearly an egregious act, you're an asshole. Now, you might just have your hands tied. Yeah, the, the <laughs> boy, talk about, talk about all, on top of all that, like the money getting taken back, everybody's pissed everybody's pissed when that shit happens and it does happen. Um, yeah, I, the, the technician now largely, if it's software related is hands off. Now, if you got air ride on your car and there's no module interfacing, but you bring your car in because you're having some suspension noise, it may seem dumb that like if you put air ride on your car and you have suspension noise, you're going to bring it to the dealership. But trust me, people do this. It is dumb. It is dumb, clearly. But, but I mean, frankly, the dealership and, and just for the audience, if you're not familiar, if you have air ride on your car, you want people who work at dealerships are the least prepared people to work on a car that has air ride. They work on cars that are basically stock all day long. That's all they work on. They've 90% of the people in, in, in a dealership, they may never have even seen a car with air ride before in terms of, <laughs> in terms of, that's on, true. Yeah. In, ter, in terms of like in the, on their lift to work on ever. And people kind of cock their head at that and like, how is that possible? Because dealerships don't see heavily modified cars because that's not where you would go if you were heavily modified. You would go to somewhere like our shop and we don't even do heavy, like heavy advanced like modification, but a car with air wouldn't be a real surprise for us. You know, someone like Mike, uh, our buddy who's uh, Euro wise, you know, people who do more modified cars are going to be the people to go to for that. Now you want people who specialize. Don't, don't make a mistake. You otherwise you'll regret it. If you bring it to, you know, Joe shit, the audio guy, um, he will fuck your car up immensely. Um, but 
the guy at the dealership, he just comes in to work on cars. 90% of them are not enthusiasts. They don't, they don't modify their own cars. They show up to work. They go home. They just want to make a paycheck. Yeah, they, they legit like don't, for the most part, there's a, there's a good number of enthusiasts. I think especially in the VW world, there's a good number of enthusiasts that work at the dealership and guys that are like razor sharp, super care about your car. Um, but man, a, a lot of them just, they don't give a shit your car's modified. They don't think it's cool. They just see like, great, now I got to get the wood blocks out. I got to stick them under. I got to drive the car up on the wood blocks. I got to do the service. And then I got to put the wood blocks away. And, and to the average person, it's like, cool. You spent four minutes extra working on my car. Good job complaining about that. What they don't see is four minutes is essentially one-tenth of an hour because that's how technicians get paid in tenths of an hour. Uh, an oil change pays three or four-tenths of an hour, so figure 18 to 24 minutes. If you're doing an oil change at a dealership, start to finish from car, from getting in the car to pull it in to getting out of the car to pull it out in 24 minutes, you're probably not doing all the things that you have to do for an oil change at a dealership. It, uh, so, if you yeah, hustle and, your ass off, you can, but you gotta be, uh, you have to yeah, be that, but that relies hustling. on everybody else doing their shit too, yeah. which does not fucking happen. It doesn't. Correct. You're yep. not, you're not in 24 minutes going to get the car, walking from your bay to the, to the service drive, getting the car, driving it in, topping off all the fluids, setting the tire pressures, filling out an MPI, doing the oil change, drain and fill, filter, taking off a fucking thousand screws for a belly pan, then test drive, resetting all the lights, reset, and then test driving the car six miles in 24 minutes. Not oh, yeah. happening. No, yeah, Promise yeah, no, you no, no. that shit ain't happening. Six mile test drive. I, I, I did not realize you were including a six mile test drive. Yeah, two, uh, to, two to six mile, uh, at minimum two mile test drive. Yeah, uh, especially if it's a Beetle convertible and one of the triple squares has been sheared off at the, at the fucking head of it. That, those are the real money ones when you have a, a Beetle with the, if, for anybody not familiar, Beetle, triple, uh, Beetle convertibles have a very metal skid plate, but at the back of it, they had triple square bolts that, were tr uh, that would scrape on things and what would happen is the metal would be redeposited as it scraped to where <laughs> the triple square would be completely covered up with the material that redeposited so you couldn't get a fucking bolt in a triple square head in there and now you you were fucked you were completely yeah. fucked you got to change oil it makes you want to kill yourself whoever thought triple squares on that belly pan were a good idea I'd like to have a nice long conversation with them. It's kind of like that asshole Volkswagen uh, engineer from Germany who told me on the FSI that I was wrong in saying that the FSI integrated air filter, mass airflow housing, engine cover was a good idea. I'm like, this is fucking dumb. He's like, well, you're dumb because you just need to like work around it. Then he had to rig up this series of fucking bungee cords to have it all connected, but still be able to like look at the coils while we were trying to diagnose this car. And I'm just like, uh -huh. yeah, suck it. Yeah, yeah. It, it is dumb. It is dumb. And, and 80 or 100,000 miles in, they all crack eventually, which is Everyone's really fucking broken. All yeah. of them are at this point. If you have an FSI without a busted engine cover, one, you've probably had it replaced at some point in its career. You live in Florida where it never gets cold or you're lying and it is broken or you've thrown it in the trash and put a stage 100 cool guy cold air intake. Oh, I like that. Stage 100. Pretty good. Super fast. Just like that uh, AWE one I put on. Do you guys sell AWE? Just... We don't. We don't. They're, mi they're missing out. They, uh, yeah. That complicated reasons, but we don't. Yeah, reasons are reasons are for things that happen. <laughs> so I guess I guess to like sum it up, look, if you want to modify your car, I think Paul and I are on the same page with like, hell yeah, do it. It's cool. The modern VWs are so mod friendly and you get so much for the money that you spent. But like I said at the beginning, if you are not prepared to make any repair on that car, don't do it. This is why my Torag, I feel like Donald Trump, this is why uh this is why my Torag is still stock. 
because there's 7,000, 8,000 miles left of warranty on it. If that shit breaks, uh, it's expensive, mad expensive. And more importantly, you don't want to dick with it. I don't want to do it. If I'm doing anything, I was actually thinking the other day, like this car would be really awesome with a big turbo upgrade, but that's dumb. Why would I think things like that? Um, the golf, on the other hand, uh, if something breaks on it, I'm not super happy, but fuck it. Like, whatever, you know, you got to rebuild the engine. Cool. Sucks. Uh, but you know, you do it. I don't want to rebuild a three liter diesel. I, I really don't. I don't. Why not? I just, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, no, Jack. So Jack at our shop actually has the same exact same reason. Although he beats the living shit out of his his Touareg off road, uh, nonstop. And uh, that if you haven't seen, we have a video uh, where we went off road with our Touareg. We went with a, a Touareg. We went with Mike from Eurowise. He he makes a bunch of like skid plates and bullshit and lift stuff and blah blah blah. Whatever. Those guys drive like they they are in a, a hurry to get to a wedding that they're late for through off-road trails uh, because they all have skid plates on everything and whatever. And uh, yeah, so if you haven't seen that video, you can almost see a, a Cayenne flip over, which is pretty cool. That, that is pretty awesome. I would like to see a Cayenne flip over. A buddy of mine has a Cayenne that got totaled and uh, he's trying to, trying to get us to make a 24-hour lemons car, but the whole interior has to be gutted because it's all moldy. Uh, so I don't know. Bro, Moldy cayenne. It, what kind of cayenne is it? What year? Uh, first gen. Three so, six, three point six, or, or, or I don't know. I don't know what engine. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're when, good. back when the cayenne was shittier than the Torag. Yeah, the, yeah, the first gen cayennes are fucking ugly. They're, they're so awful. ugly. You know, it's funny. I it made me realize the Torag has aged very well. Like when I look at the first gen Torag, which obviously you know we own one but um they're actually pretty attractive like pretty good looking car still obviously aged but compared to a first gen cayenne they're disgusting they just yeah bleh. now the, the first gen cayennes were shittier in every way than the tour like even back in 04 05 06 they were shittier than the Torag in every way yeah the later ones okay whatever the facelift one Mike, Mike has a facelift one, which is a, you know, a better looking Cayenne. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you, but you do, but get, make it an off-road thing. Check out that off-road video. I hear that. I hear there's a video on that. I, it, I don't know why is, I feel like I got to get super close when I say that kind of there stuff. There is a video on it. I feel, I feel like I do uh, have to get, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> weird. Anyway, uh, what are your thoughts on this drink? You said you liked it earlier. Are you still feeling it? Or? I do like it. I actually do like it. Even though I have some lime juice that might poison me. Uh, diarrhea is likely tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> overall I, I'm enjoying it. I think, you know, it fits the, you know, the Gimlet, the name for me, Funny enough, you probably have never heard of this. The only time I had heard of Gimlet before this was uh, when we were looking up drinks, but also before that was there's a company who makes podcasts who was named Gimlet. And that's actually the, <laughs> that's first, funny. the first time I'd heard of it, which we do a shit job historically. Well, I wouldn't say historically, always. Uh, if you want to listen only on audio, we have a podcast version that you can find that on itunes or stitcher or uh google play didn't where you google can, play didn't google play drop their podcast feed maybe i'm an apple user so i don't i don't know I, i'm an I, apple person as well so i don't know that but we should we should probably find that information out it might be pertinent information or i'm <laughs> i'm sure someone watching or listening well if you're <laughs> listening you probably know if you're or man i don't know i don't know if you i don't know what you know yeah. uh i i don't i don't i don't somebody's even know. somebody's an android user because they don't yeah. like pictures being very good yeah because words and <laughs> i was <laughs> so i have this fucking dji thing that i just got this is this is relevant i got this dji thing and it's the 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 number four mobile mobile that looks gimbal. like a weird sex toy yeah it is it's but it's cool like it works really good it's got this magnetic thing that you just like clip on your phone it's really cool oh, except it doesn't fucking work 
and I've, I've had it for four days and I've been on with DJI support wow. like a hundred times. And I'm like, man, if Apple made this shit, like you can say all the shit you want about Apple. And, and I, I won't like largely disagree with that, but man, their shit just fucking works. Well, I will say this it, aside from this kind of a side note on the podcast side. Uh, if you have a problem with that, Nathan might be able to help you. Cause I know when we set up our DJ, our uh, Ronan, it was a shit show for him. So hmm, could be something. I've been on, so it works. It's just like, you'll be, you'll be like, you know, doing the thing. And then it'll just start doing this. Oh yeah. That's ours did that too. Nathan, like, what Nathan had fuck, to work man? through the, the whole like. Yeah. It's like, you know, you said it was a, a sex toy. Like it vibrates. Like I assume a sex toy does. So I've seen um, that. Maybe, uh, maybe, I don't, I don't know. I'm waiting for their support to get back. I just bought a new drone too. And I'm wondering like how long before I crash it. I flew my other one four times before I crashed it into a tree. So, um, <laughs> I don't fly ours. I just let somebody else fly it. That way I can yell at them when they crash it. Yeah, I, it I, I, I take like 87% responsibility because it was in trail mode, like follow. So it was following my blue car and I got some really killer footage. If I were less lazy, I would let you see it right now but i'm not so like i came into my driveway and it's like the drone stopped and there's a tree and it's like drone drone and then it was it's fucked well it's dead okay so modified cars what do you got uh yeah do it it's awesome well worth the money in general but you better be prepared to uh to make that repair if you have to and also <sighs> tuning your car does not completely blanket void the warranty. Yeah. And, and import, most importantly, and I've said this a million times, and I've talked about these subjects, find a dealership that is good to work with around this stuff. It, especially now, now more than ever, just be honest because yep. you're not hiding shit anymore. And I, and the one thing I'll say for people who are tuned at home Unitronic, IE, Cobb, whatever. If you flash your car to stock and then bring it in, it's unclear to me how likely you are to get flagged. So here's, here's the one caveat. So 100%, they will be able to tell that you're flashed or have been flashed if they look deep enough. The question is, is how deep do they need to look to know you're flashed? Now, if you are somebody who tunes at home, I would, if it was me, I would err on the side of caution and bring your car back to stock before bringing it in. But I can tell you that it's not going to guarantee that you have 100% protection against anything. If there is enough depth looked into, they will be able to figure out what's going on. Uh, and, and that's it. There is no, in, in the beginning, of Mark seven, I had talked about this and is there were some questions in terms of how likely is this, whatever. I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah. I, I think it goes also deeper than an ECM flash or a TCM flash or whatever. As we move forward and you start changing adaptations and codings, um, they're going to know, they're going to know. And if the dealership technician doesn't know, and can't figure it out, right? Because that happens. I mean, the brands hold a lot of information back. You know, people think like dealership techs have access to all this fucking crazy information and the breakdowns of the cars. We don't have any of that shit. Vadcom oftentimes, for anybody who's not familiar, Vadcom has oftentimes more access than dealer techs have in some places because it, the, the manufacturer restricts you. Right. But what the dealership technicians do have access to is uh, a little thing called the brand that owns the company. And all it takes is sending a file up north to the mothership. I've said that like a hundred. I wish there was a mothership are they, tally. Are they north? Are uh, they north? Of, well, they're I not. Mean, if we were they're not south of Canada, where I am. I, I, mean, I mean, if they were in well, Canada, would they be, it wouldn't be north. Yeah, it's, you just go around the other way. Um, oh. it's, it's up more so than north but it's like north if you're laying down it's complicated right. i'm not a I'm not a mather so but anyway um all it's going to take is sending that full scan file up to the brand 
and someone at an engineering level is going to look at it and go, oh, that's not right. Johnny Race Car has been fucking with his car, not covered. They call, you, they call you Johnny Race Car, definitely, 100%. Yeah, that's what I always call, uh, call these folks Johnny Race Car. Uh, or customer has to pay to put their car back 100% stock. Then we start the diagnostic process to see because Johnny Race Car tried to code his windows down with the clicker and uh, he fucked up the coding and didn't Which, save it. To be clear, th there, there are some legitimate concerns on the dealer end in terms of, of dealing with stock cars. So especially when you're dealing with heavy diagnostic and, and this is as people who diagnose cars, you know, I have this shop, we diagnose cars. Oh, sometimes they're in depth and people will bring us cars that other shops couldn't diagnose. Now they bring to us. You know, when you're talking about a car like that, now you're talking about a significant diag and bringing a car that has a lot of unknowns, which is what tuning does, is it brings in unknown variables to a diagnostic. Now, we are experienced with, with modified cars, so we have a little more knowledge in terms of what we can expect. Dealer techs, as we mentioned before, are basically people who have not, no experience with modified cars. They may have never even seen it car and air ride or whatever in their life and so the reason why they often react like complete dick faces is because they assume whatever you've done has caused the problem now this is really interesting actually um i so we were one of the first dealers in the country when i was a kefir to offer tuning um what year 2006 probably 2006 we offered revo software to our customers at a dealer there's a lot of complicated parts of that, but something that would happen that which would blow most people away is I now keep in mind at this time, I was the parts manager of a dealership. We were selling tunes to customers. Um, I would flash them because nobody else at the dealership wanted any part of them and nobody else, everybody else was scared to death of them, whatever. We would flash cars and six months later, a car would come back for a check engine light. And a technician, and this is not just one technician, this is a bunch of different technicians, would walk up to the parts counter, ask for me, hand me the keys and say, this car has a check engine light. And I would say, <laughs> I would say, okay, what, what cool for? Cool story, bro. I would say, okay, what for? And they would say, I don't know, I haven't scanned it yet, but it's tuned. And I would say, go fucking diagnose the car and then come talk to me if there's a concern. That happened, and I'm saying that happened a lot. Like, a fucking lot. I believe it. Not surprised by that at all. Yeah, so just to give people context of how inexperienced and stupid some technicians can be is... That happened. And that happened, didn't happen one time, didn't happen two times, didn't happen three times. It happened a lot of times. And, and I guess for, fortunately, I, I, didn't, I didn't just try to diagnose the cars for them, but the reality is they just assumed the tune was the cause of the problem. I don't know why. I don't know what made them think that tuning a car just six months later just makes check engine lights. It's fucking magic. But it happens. You know, some of that I think comes from the, uh, the fear of the unknown. And it's like, I don't want to be embarrassed that I couldn't figure this car out. So it's tuned. That's my way out. Also, traditionally for a lot of technicians, diagnostic work does not pay very well. Uh, and that's more of a systemic problem in, in the automotive industry. Uh -huh. So like when we talk, when, when we go down these roads, I, I, empathize more with the technician than a lot of people probably do because I've been there and it's like certainly the customers the customer's not telling you the truth they're saying their car's not tuned and you drive it and the shit's fast as hell you look at your boost numbers and it's 25 percent over uh requested boost and you're like D this shit doesn't happen on a car that's running like normal so the only logical explanation is the tune and then there's the whole, like, now you got to tell your advisor and your advisor's a pussy and they don't want to talk to the customer. So you get the service manager involved. Service manager just says, fix it. I don't give a fuck. I ain't taking, talking to the customer, just warranty it. Or they're the opposite and don't. So 
look, I know a lot of people hate dealership technicians. I, I've seen some straight scumbag dealership technicians. I get it. But, but if you are an enthusiast, it is a good thing to have a dealership technician that you know that you're kind of buddies with that isn't going to throw you under the bus when some shit goes down. They may not, they're not going to risk their job for your stupid ass car, but it's a good idea to have them on your side, we'll say. For sure. And that, and that's really what I've always preached is find a dealership to work with, find people who could be on your side. They'll do what they can for you. They will have limits, especially now more than ever. You know, I've always said that before, before it mattered even more, having them on your side actually mattered a shitload. Now it's like, it, it matters, but it's not all the way. It, they, there's only so much they can do now. And I've heard of, you know, we had customers who had tunes that I would consider to be suspect back in the early days of Mark 7. One of, probably the first tuner to come out with Mark 7 tunes that I can think of um, that everybody was like, oh, this shit's the bomb. Go get it. And then eventually they blew a couple engines, whatever. They, but this person blew an engine 100% related to the tune. And VW still covered it, even knowing it was tuned. I, the, the big takeaway is don't be a dickhead about it. And uh, you'll probably get further than if you stroll into the club acting the fool and, uh, you know, want to show your ass and how awesome you are and how much you know about VW because it's going to be up to the service manager at most points to go. 100%. Sorry, Johnny race car, your shit's not covered. Yes. So for uh, the biggest lesson I could give most people is, especially if you modify your car, you're younger. First of all, don't walk into a dealership and try to use all kinds of, of, of online lingo that people use that dealerships, <laughs> they don't fucking know it. They don't know it. Don't try to use it and prove how smart you are because they don't give a fuck about you or how much you pretend to know. They know actually what they're doing. You know a bunch of online lingo that, that that community uses. Yes, but they don't give a shit about that. They don't, they, they're going to have more negative reactions to that type of attitude than they are anything else. So don't walk in like a smart ass. Don't walk in like they, you know what's wrong with your car because you definitely don't. Um, and just try to build a relationship. Yeah, be, be cool. Be cool. Don't be Johnny Big Dick uh, when you stroll up in there. And you'll probably, you'll probably get further than you might think you would rolling up, being cool. Look, the whole goal is you want the dealership to be on your side. Do you really think pissing in their Wheaties and calling them stupid is going to get them on your side? The answer is very clearly fucking no, it's not. So be cool about it. Yeah. And uh, you'll, you might get some more. Or you might I, not. I don't know. I think that's an episode. And I, for one, would like to be Johnny Big Dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe on the next episode. Let's wrap. And uh, yeah, so you guys can listen to the podcast if you want. You probably already subscribed to Paul and I, so there's that. Uh, I, completely meaningless, replaced this on a customer's car at some point because it was scratched. So I have an R lower what steering is column trim. It's a, it's a Golf R lower steering column trim, number 76 of 3,500. So if you own this car, 76 out of 3,500, you're missing the sticker because uh, that scratch was more important than this sticker. Let me know. I will happily uh, is that a, buy this. Is that a Mach 6? Is that a Mach 6? It, I think it's a Mach 6. Yeah, must be. Okay. Well, that's an episode, guys. Until next week, uh, bye. Yeah, that's all how you end it. Bye. <laughs>